Hi everyone, and welcome to Pathfinder, presented by Payload, the leading digital media company in the space industry. I'm your host, Mo Islam, and today we're joined by Anton Brevde, the Chief Investment Officer of IBX, an investment firm and holding company started by serial space entrepreneur Cam Gaffarian. Today's conversation is a fun one. We talk IBX's portfolio, which includes Axiom, Intuitive Machines, X Energy, and Quantum Space, as well as the state of the space industry from the investor's perspective. Before we get into it, though, a quick word from our sponsors. This week's episode is brought to you by Epsilon 3, software for complex engineering, testing, and operational procedures. Epsilon 3's web-based procedure platform enables technicians, operators, engineers, and management to instantly access information around current status of operations, release history, and historical reference of procedural content. Epsilon 3's platform is better suited for coordinating space development workflows than word processing software, Microsoft Excel spreadsheets, and other applications that are not tailored for the industry. For more information, check out epsilon3.io. Hands on. I want to begin with um, your time at Prime Movers Lab. So to start, uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, the firm history um, and then when and why you joined. Sure. And happy to be here, Mo. Thank you for inviting me. Um, Yes, my time at PML, I guess my personal journey, uh, moved out to the Bay Area after college, spent a year working in a very bizarre industry, uh, brokering used high-tech manufacturing equipment, which is as niche as it sounds. I worked at a company for a year, kind of learned about an industry, drank the Bay Area uh, Kool-Aid, and ended up starting a company with two coworkers that was an online marketplace to help factories buy and sell equipment. So that was uh, my first substantive uh, career experience was starting this company called Seta, went through YC, started when I was 22, had no idea what I was doing, um, ran that company for a number of years, and that's a whole story in and of itself. But basically in 2019 was uh, looking to do something new, um, was not planning to get into venture, I actually had a pretty negative view of venture at the time uh, when I went through YC. Paul Graham was still running it. And I feel like the uh, perspective he shared was like, best case scenario, VCs don't mess up your company. You know, they just are quietly on the cap table. And that was kind of the view I had. Um, And really what I was looking to do, I I didn't have another startup that I was ready to start at the time. I thought maybe I would join um, like a series B stage company, maybe be a chief of staff, maybe be an executive until I had another idea for a company. But I just so happened to come across a job listing for this new VC fund called Prime Movers Lab um, and was really taken with its vision as, uh, you know, the way that, that we described what we did there was invest in breakthrough scientific inventions that have the ability to impact billions of lives across a wide range of sectors from space to energy um, and just really amazing technologies. And, and I saw that. And then I saw the person who had founded it, uh, a guy named Dakin Sloss. Uh, and I had actually met him at YC Demo Day seven years previously. And he had made a, a big impression uh, on me at the time. And uh, so I ended up uh, joining him was maybe the fifth person on the team. In 2019, when I joined, uh, we had sub $100 million in assets under management. Uh, just kind of building up the first fund and ended up spending three years uh, from 2019 to uh, this year there. Uh, and it was a, a whirlwind time, uh, both in the market and just in general in VC land. And the fund grew from sub 100 to over a billion in AUM and uh, a, a lot of interesting experiences and learning experiences. But ultimately, my role evolved from uh, at the beginning, wearing lots of hats, it, the fund itself was a startup and we all were, were doing many different things. And as we scaled and grew, ended up moving on the investing team. And as we'll talk about, ended up focusing on the space sector primarily um, and ended up being a general partner there before my recent transition. Have your uh, views about venture changed? Yeah, actually tremendous. I think there is <laughs> there's the potential to do more than not mess up a, a business. I think... The biggest thing I learned was in at Aceta, I raised two party rounds. There was no lead investor. So no one was really, you know, completely invested in the success of the company. So no one, you know, it'd be great if if I had the discipline to provide all the accountability accountability I needed. But one thing I've seen is in, investors serve a even if they didn't add value, just the fact of having an engaged investor provide accountability make, and, and be a, 
a, a, a positive force of tension to help generate questions and, and generate accountability. I've, I've seen how valuable that is. Then you factor in the fact that you know you can get a lead investor that has the ability to invest across multiple funds, and that removes a lot of the risk. Where if you do a good job, you know, and you execute, you can raise additional capital from them. You obviously have the signaling risk if they decide not to. So there's a risk there. Um, and then there, I have now seen both at Prime Movers Lab. I'm really proud of how engaged we got with companies, but I've now seen a, a number of funds that are able to do that, and even angel investors that really do uh, roll up their sleeves and have. For us, we always talked about having a service mindset. A lot of uh, VCs have this attitude of, uh, you know, smart arrogance or some some version of that um, that they're superior to the entrepreneur. And technically, this you know CEO does report to the board. But the way we approach it, I think there's a, a a good set of investors that do it this way, having a service mindset that while technically if the CEO isn't performing, there's going to be accountability there. But in the meantime. We're there to be of service to the CEO, and I, I really like that piece of it. So um, I, I do have um, one one more on sort of um, PML specifically because d- deep tech or frontier tech, or you know whatever you want to call it, um, yep. is much more of a common term that I uh, see within the venture community. Meaning that more yep. investors are focused on it as a, as a as a uh, as a theme, for, for lack of a better yep. word. What drove sort of, um, you know, the culture investment philosophy of the firm when at a time it was just investing in, you know, hard, um, you know, scientific, uh, you know, driven, science driven technical technologies was not nearly as common as it is today. Or maybe you might disagree and say, well, no, it was actually quite common even then. But to me, it doesn't, doesn't seem, it doesn't feel that way at, when you kind of do the relative comparison yeah. of the number of investors focused on it then versus, versus yeah. the number of investors focused on it today. Yeah, no, I, I definitely think it, it was not a super popular idea at the time. And, and yeah, I don't think anyone would claim that, you know, Prime Brewers up was, was first in the space, you know, folks like Lux and Eclipse, uh, DCBC, Kosla have been doing deep tech deals for, for a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, the, the vision, you know, Dakin re- really gets the credit. I mean, he, he was the founder of Prime Movers Lab. He had been interested in deep tech investing for many years prior to starting the fund and was in the uh, friends and family round of Boom Supersonic and had a natural inclination towards highly technical companies and was highly motivated by investing in companies that could make a meaningful impact um, and not in a... Uh, uh, in, in a capitalist friendly way, meaning, you know, that can build great biz- businesses while having a, a huge impact solving what we call a global scale must solve problem. And that pretty quickly gets you into investing in these type of deeply technical uh, areas. And then kind of seeing in the venture landscape, most firms and most investors are not built to underwrite hardware risk. And so that was really part of the strategy and, and kind of moat that Prime Movers Lab focused on was building out a team that could do that. And so we had a number of technical, I don't have a PhD, but most of my colleagues did. Um, and we were able to underwrite, you know, the science and engineering risk that's inherent in these companies that right. makes it a very different diligence process than, you know, investing in fintech or something like that. Right. Well, so um, I, I know you recently left um, PML. So what are you, uh, what are you working on now? Yeah. So I met a, I didn't meet a girl. I met a founder. <laughs> uh, I met a founder <laughs> named Cam Gafarian. Um, yeah, so I mean, one of the the fun parts of being a VC is you get to spend your day interacting with you know, these incredible founders that are you know, literally changing the world. And uh, one of them that we backed twice is is a serial entrepreneur named Cam Gafarian. Uh, uh, maybe I can go into more of his kind of uh, history and track record, but. Uh, he's the co-founder and executive chairman of Axiom Space and a number of other entities. Uh, we invested at a Prime Movers Lab into Axiom Series B and his most recent uh, entity, a company called Quantum Space. And so got to know Cam. Um, I kind of alluded to it, but during my time at Prime Movers Lab, I, I became uh, really passionate and focused on investing in uh, the space economy. And Cam is is on the leading edge of that and has been a pioneer in the commercial space movement. And so this opportunity came up uh, to lead his 
could call it a family office, you could call it a holding company, you could call it a venture studio, but it, it's an entity called IBX, we're, we're up in our, our swag <laughs> here, uh, which stands for imagine, believe, execute, imagine a certain future, believe that it's possible, and then go get it done. Um, and so this is the entity that kind of sits on top of all these various entities that he's founded, including Axiom Space, X Energy, Intuitive Machines, Quantum Space. Um, and so about five or six months ago, I joined as chief investment officer of IBX. So um, why um, why the switch, right? And, 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 and one thing you alluded to is obviously working with Cam. So um, understand yep. that part. But from the perspective of like going from an investor who had a space focus to now... Yep. Pretty much working, uh, and I and I know there's a, you know a, a company within sort of that portfolio that doesn't necessarily fit into the space space vertical yep. directly, but clearly yep. it sounds like it's it, it seems like you're spending much more time now in the space industry than you were before. Yeah, yeah, I feel like in a way uh, <laughs> it might be slightly strongly worded, but I'm not gonna say I felt like a fraud, but it's one thing to. Uh, you can learn a lot about an industry by interacting with founders. You know that that's one of the best ways. I'd say mm-hmm. maybe the second best way to learn about an industry is to sure. spending a lot of time working with founders. But I felt, uh, uh, you know, one, I felt a deep connection with Cam and his mission, which is really aligned with Prime Movers Lab as well. But the opportunity to actually get my hands dirty and have more of an operating role uh, in in companies, in space companies, and work alongside Cam, I just felt like uh, was such an enabler for the trajectory that I wanted to go on. I, I, I have confidence and conviction in, in the space market. I know it's where I want to be spending the rest of my career, and this felt like the right move to, uh, yeah, just get a much more hands-on experience on, on what it takes to build these companies, you know, as opposed to, it's one thing to be on a board, but now you know, I get to you know actually sit in on, on day-to-day meetings and all hands and and hear the management team discuss kind of these trade-offs between spend and engineering development and ability to raise capital. It's it's um it's been already just incredibly valuable and I think will translate to me being a better space investor in the long run. So your your official title is chief investment officer, correct? Yep. And That's so right. what does that, what, what does that look like today? What is your role? What are your roles and responsibilities? Yeah, it feels, it feels quite uh, similar to what I was doing previously. Uh, I think in 2023, there's not a whole lot of investing going on. It's a lot of uh, portfolio management. So the difference here is instead of, you know, 40 companies, there's, there's really four venture entities. There's like 10 other uh, more, uh, you could call them, uh, businesses that camp started that don't require venture funding but my energy is really on on the four companies maybe we should just run through run through them really quick yeah let's do that i'll do a one sentence we can go into more detail so there's axiom space which is building the first commercial space station to replace the iss when it gets decommissioned intuitive machines which is building lunar hardware including a, a lunar lander that's set to launch in, in the coming months it's a company called X Energy, which is a leader in uh, advanced nuclear. This is a nuclear fission, not fusion. And then Quantum Space, which is focused on uh, uh, geo to cis lunar uh, infrastructure, including space situational awareness, comms relay, space weather forecasting, a, a number of exciting things. And so my first my first responsibility is, is, is supporting that existing portfolio and making sure that they are executing well. And that, that's really where the majority of my energy has been this year. Um, the second hat will be managing new companies that we decide to incubate. So all four of those companies were co-founded by CAM as, as part of IBX. Um, and while we have our hands full, uh, we're, we're an ambitious <laughs> bunch. And uh, so there's a, a list of, of 20 ideas that, that we want to get off the ground. Um, both in space as well as energy and other areas. Uh, we're talking about a humanoid robotics company and, and talking with the founder right now about that. So incubation. And then the last piece is, is investments. So kind of traditional minority investments in, in, in companies. So uh, a space station business uh, landing on the moon, uh, yep. nuclear, nuclear reactors. <laughs> and I, I, what's the two, word, two words I would use to describe quantum? Like... Sp- space let's say beyond earth infrastructure beyond earth infrastructure okay so that's a lot a lot of uh, somewhat similar but seemingly different different companies 
uh, is, is there a common thread behind between all the companies as, as sort of cam has been thinking about, or has it been like, Hey, uh, let's, let's find all these difficult problems. And I love solving yeah. difficult problems. So we're going to figure out how to, how to, how to create a solution around this. Yeah, so it's kind of the intersection of two things. There's one, the last part you said, uh, he calls them civilization impact programs. Uh, we got, we got <laughs> like a lot that. of acronyms, a lot of acronyms over here. So, uh, SIP, CIPs. So, yeah, things that can really move the needle. Um, and then intersecting with the unique advantage that CAM and the Cambosphere and IBX has. And I'll explain a little bit what that is, but effectively, these are all companies that are on an uh, uh, overlap of public and private markets and the privatization of, of government. And so it's helpful to mention a little bit about Cam's background and kind of why he's had the success he's had. So Cam himself, super you know, interesting guy, I was born in Iran. Uh, Iran came over here when he was 18, got like four or five degrees, worked for a bunch of the primes, was heavily inspired by you know the moon landings when he was in, in, in Iran and uh, knew he wanted to work in the space industry. And then the first business that he built, bootstrapped and ran for 25 years was a company called SGT. And it was in a world that I really knew nothing about in, until uh, I learned from Cam, uh, government engineering services, which uh, you know is, is kind of cryptic what that refers to. But basically, if, if you look at NASA, for example, a lot of the work they do, whether it's engineering hardware for a lander or managing mission control for the ISS or just the facilities management of Goddard Space Center, they bid all those contracts out to private companies. And there's a bunch of old school companies like the KBR and Collins Aerospace and Raytheon and kind of companies that have been around for decades that have dominated that world. And CAM over the 25 year time period was able to build an incredibly large business taking market share from those companies. And after 25 years, ended up selling it for $375 million, was the sole owner. Um, and so that was, of course, a great win and liquidity event for him. But the experience he gained there that's very unique as it relates to the startup world is how to interact with the government, how to interact with NASA, how to bid on these proposals. It's there. And I've been learning about this. This is another motivation was just to see how, how cams companies uh, are able to win the contracts that they do. And there's nothing nefarious here. It's just, it is a, it is a, it is a very specific process to be able to bid these contracts and, bid on them in a way that's going to be digestible by these proposal uh, 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 reviewers. And so he's taking that experience and, and literally some of those same people, those proposal writers, and there is an IBX entity that's under mm -hmm. this holding company that all it does is help bid on contracts for the companies. And so you know, Axiom has a $1.2 billion contract to build NASA's next lunar uh, spacesuit. X Energy has a 50-50 cost share with the Department of Energy. It's a multi-billion dollar deal where the DOE will pay for half of the first uh, reactor. So that's kind of like the through line is how do we build something that can be dual use, serve both the government need and the commercial market, but leverage government contracts to reduce the capital requirements for the business. And like we'll talk about, I, I think, this later, but key risk for all, all deep tech companies, you know, unless the technology doesn't work is they can't get funded. And so yeah. being able to leverage these government contracts, that's, that's kind of the secret sauce. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that makes, uh, that makes a ton of sense. So, um, Axiom, we actually had, um, Seth, C CEO, Mike Safrandini on, on, he, he was our very first guest on, oh, amazing. on Pat yeah. So we spent, we spent nice. a lot of time on that company. Um, we haven't, I don't actually think we've had any representation from intuitive machines. So, um, so we'll, we'll need to get, we'll need, we'll certainly need to get that. And I know this is space focused yeah. podcast, but I do want to talk for a second about X energy. So, yeah. um, I was doing a little bit of a kind of reading on, on, on the website. So I uh, building small modular nuclear reactors. Um, yep. which is, uh, again, another pretty interesting space right now within venture. I yep. know the, the, the category has started to heat up a little bit in terms of like interest from the investment perspective. Um, but X energy has been around since I think 2009. That's right. So, so I'm, I'm curious, um, and if, if you know, I know, I know you're also, you know, getting acquainted with all of these companies. Yeah. Um, but 
for X Energy, look, what was the, um, what was sort of the, uh, sort of driving or decision point there to start, to start that company? Um, especially uh, w- w- when he did. And, you know, yeah. I, nu- nuclear is getting a lot more popular now in the, pu- in from public perception perspective, but it, I, I would say back then it, you know, wasn't. Totally. You know, or it's still, it's, it still <laughs> yeah. isn't to a degree, but yeah, I, I'm just kind of curious. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would say this is, this is really a credit to Cam and all of his companies. They all seem super early for what they're going to do, but that that's kind of the point, right? When it when it's obvious that there's going to be a commercial space station and and, and that a bunch of engines join late, it's uh, typically uh, a, often you'll be too late. So the story with X Energy, as as I've been uh, told by Cam, it actually starts with the orphanage in Africa. His co-founder at SGT that ended up uh, buying out of the business and their great friends was a, also a pastor. I haven't, I haven't heard the whole backstory there. It sounds, sounds like a very interesting guy, but he yeah. was supporting some orphans in Kinshasa, the capital of the DRC asked cam if he wanted to help sponsor a couple orphans. And that grew, you know, kind of sequentially over time. And then eventually he went out to go for a visit. And it was during a visit, I think in 08 or 09 to Kinshasa where he saw you know, it was one of the poorest countries in the world, maybe the poorest country in the world. Um, and he saw the lack of uh, electric infrastructure. There just wasn't electricity in large swaths of the country. And even though, yeah, he doesn't come from the energy sector, he had spent his entire career in the space sector. It, um, uh, it came, came like many of the best founders I worked with at PML are, are highly intuitive folks. And he just was struck with inspiration that, not to start a, a nuclear fission company, but to solve a energy problem um, mm-hmm. and, and went down this rabbit hole and saw the connection between quality of life and uh, uh, and cost of energy. And so then went on the search to try and find the solution and ended up landing on what he believed nuclear fission was the right um, uh, solution until f- fusion came online, which is, you know, probably still we got some time to go there and then ended up finding a team in South Africa that had this, uh, you know, and I, I have not gotten a chance to go super deep on the technology here, but they refer to it as gen four technologies, these, mm-hmm. uh, 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 hot gas reactors that are inherently safe, meaning if they lose power, if there, there's an earthquake or a tsunami, there's no way for them to melt down. They inherently kind of shut off as soon as, as soon as they're disrupted. Um, and, and that was kind of the origin story there. Interesting. And then, um, quantum, cause that's one that I actually don't know a lot about. Um, uh, would be curious to hear a little bit about, um, uh, quantum as well. Yeah, I think this was really driven, you know, part, when we talked about kind of interacting with the government, part of it is, you know, yeah, bidding these contracts. Another part of it is kind of sniffing out the, they call it the demand signal, but you know, basically what, 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 what is the government going to want to spend money on in the future? And obviously you want to figure that out kind of far ahead of time. So you have time to, to build something to address that. And so the inspiration for quantum was around uh, this area between the earth and the moon called cislunar space that right now doesn't have a lot going on, but as we know, the, the activity on the moon is heating up and there is a big, Whereas a lot of these other companies are civil space, NASA focused, this is really a, a, a dual use company where the, the first customer is really going to be the national security uh, sector, where mm-hmm. there's a big gap in our understanding of what's happening in cislunar space. You can Google, they call it the cone of, the cone of shame. Uh, going like from Earth to the moon, and there's a Chinese satellite on the backside of the moon that we don't know what it's doing. Our ability to do position navigation and timing in cislunar space is basically non-existent. And so the idea here is a fleet of satellites called QuantumNet that will host a series of payloads to do space situational awareness, so tracking things between geo-orbit and the moon, uh, providing a comms relay, tracking space weather, hosting payloads, um, and some of this will take time to develop because again, there's not a lot happening in cislunar. So it's going to start focused on geo services, things for geostationary orbit, but the long-term vision is building this quantum net. Right. And again, right. another example yeah. of actually like what's, what's interesting here and 
another reason why I wanted to um, get closer to companies and founders is as a VC, you spend a lot of time like writing blog posts and things literally I did about the future of an industry <laughs> and thinking about what's going to happen. And that's fine. But like the founders are the ones that, you know, create that future. And like, I never would have said that I was going to do a cislunar investment. That's not something that I was like, can't wait to make a cislunar investment. But then you meet a founder with a very compelling vision that has a track record of success. Um, and so that was one of the last deals I did at PML was invest- investing. In yeah, space. It, look, it sounds really cool. In a way, a lot of your role hasn't, hasn't changed. Um, yeah, but in, in certain ways it has in that, you know, you're working with someone who obviously is very, is a very experienced entrepreneur and is doing a lot of very cool yep. things. Um, so, uh, no, I think, I think that sounds great. And you mentioned blog posts. So we're going to, we're going <laughs> to talk a little bit about some of your blog posts, but, uh, Hold before we get account. into that, yeah, exactly. Before we get into that, we're just going to take a quick break. <laughs> Um, just to hear from our sponsors. So Anton, just stay with us for a second. By utilizing Epsilon 3 software platforms, engineers can create builds, track builds through AIT, revise and trust test procedures, and more. Not only will engineers save time and frustration looking for information in multiple places, but it will speed up your AIT processes. Unlike using simple documents or generic project management tools, Epsilon 3 provides synchronization and standardization that streamlines and refines processes and procedures. Check out their website, Epsilon3.io for more information. Anton, welcome back. Thank so uh, right before we went on our break, you mentioned, uh, you know, when you were a VC, and how, yeah. uh, you know, there, you wrote some blog posts as most VCs do. Uh, I want to talk about two in particular, um, one which I actually reference very often. Um, which was your, uh, which is one where you kind of reference your space market map and how do you, how you categorize the space industry from an investment perspective. So, um, just to kind of start, let's just talk a little bit about how, how, how do you categorize, um, putting your investor hat on now? How do you categorize the space industry? For sure. Also, I should point out, I've mentioned this explicitly. I'm still a venture partner at Prime Movers Lab, still supporting the team there, still on a number of board seats. Uh, PML companies and advising them on space investment. So right. uh, still a big fan and supporter of, of what they do there. Um, yeah, so my, uh, uh, thank you for the kind words. I mean, I feel like it's super simplistic. So, um, but yeah, the, 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 and again, I should explain, no prior space experience beyond reading a lot of science fiction. Uh, the reason I, you know, I got decided to focus on space was, uh, but when I joined the team, we had already done an investment in the space industry, Momentus, which is a whole story in and of itself. But uh, we already had uh, a bit of a, there wasn't that many people investing in space back in 2019. So that in and of itself started generating a lot of inbound. And as the team got bigger, you know, there's a lot of benefits to specializing. And really what did it for me was the launch cost chart. It was just, you know, seeing how fast launch costs were going down. That to me was like, if there was one thing that, Mm-hmm. gave me the confidence to to double down on the sector. So then uh, you know, spent the next two years just going as deep as I can on the space sector, talking to as many companies as I could, uh, bringing a very much a beginner's mind out of necessity to it. And after having screened, you know, 100 plus companies, the framework, again, super simple, is it, that came together was who is the company serving? Are they serving an Earth-based customer? So space for earth are they serving other space companies space for space and then there's this bit of a catch-all bucket that i called beyond earth for things like quantum space and intuitive machines uh asteroid mining uh that felt to me kind of like a whole separate category and um you know so space for earth these are kind of the uh larger existing companies if you think about satellite communications big pre-existing markets because they're not selling to other space companies they're selling to customers on the earth so uh you have the traditional players like a viasat that you know sell uh, mm-hmm. internet services to to planes and then the new companies like a OneWeb or starlink or eSpace who we invested in um and then there's the whole earth observation sector so again these are uh much less speculative business models and, and so we'll kind of get into that and then whereas space for space is uh companies selling services to other space companies and many of those space companies end up being other startups. And so there's some interesting dynamics there. Right. So really thinking about it, if you think about it from a risk reward perspective, kind of going yep. from left to right, 
um, you know, the farther along that spectrum of, of, of space for Earth to kind of be on Earth that you go, uh, increasing kind of risk reward scenarios from, a, from, I guess, I guess the, the farther right you move, the more venture like you get in terms of like, um, potential investment. Uh, you said venture like. Yeah. So, so what I, what I mean. Yeah, what I mean is like the Beyond Earth segment feels the feels the most what I would call science fiction like, right? If you're actually looking yeah, at totally. all the categories. Yeah, but when you say venture like in terms of producing a, a venture like return, I would I wouldn't say that necessarily you know goes the same way. You know, like the you know the the trade off is satellite communications like gener- is is the biggest end market I would say uh, pretty obviously and. And you know, Starlink drives much of the valuation. You know, this better than I do. Uh, mm-hmm. How much of it uh, 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 for SpaceX? But it's also uh, the most competitive as a result, and also has these insane uh, upfront capital expenditure needs. And so there's a big prize there, but the degree of difficulty is like ten out of ten. And you know, we we. One of the biggest investments I did was in eSpace, which is Greg Weiler's uh, uh, latest space company. And he's been a pioneer in satellite communications, founder of OneWeb. Um, and I was on the board and, and saw what it took to build those companies. And it's there's the capital needs. There's building a constellation of hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of satellites, the complexity there. Then the whole regulatory aspect of getting uh, you know uh, ground rights in each country that you want to operate. Mm-hmm. So... Um, big prize a lot of complexity and then you could look at something like you know building satellite buses i'd say i put this for space for space less complicated um uh in the realm of uh uh uh, conjecture pretty low i mean there's the sda there's there's people need satellite buses but how big can that business be that's like that's the question um, and it's hard to tell because it's reliant on other startups. And when will all those startups rise together? Um, yeah, one thing I put in that in that uh, blog post is if you talk to enough of these companies, you start getting a little bit of vertigo because you see it's startups selling to startups selling to startups. And so you're stacking risk in that way. Uh, which made me really uncomfortable. Yeah, I think I think that's a good point, actually. Which uh, which which was going to get to my second kind of question around sort of the current state of the of the industry. And I think that um, you, you know your point is right because you know we've I, I've seen a lot of decks over the last couple of years yep. um, in the industry, and you know there's a lot of companies who state that they have um, you know 100 million, 200 million in LOIs, yep. or, or you know sometimes much much more than that. And uh, when you when you look at the breakdown of those, you know, MOUs, LOIs, even signed contracts, you start yeah. to see, oh well, actually, wait, this company also is in need of capital or is raising money, and this other yeah. company just started a year ago, and wait, this company doesn't even have a product yet. <laughs> so there is yeah. there's de- definitely an element of that. Now, now that you're sitting, I guess, a little bit more on the company side, how do you, how, yeah. how are you seeing things from the IBX perspective? Like in terms of the state of the sort of the space economy today, not from like a tech perspective, but more from like an investor fundraising perspective. What have you noticed? Yeah. Yeah. And I would, I would say the, the most recent example of, of, of the dynamic you just mentioned, um, I saw someone posting about like Terra and Orbital and, and trying to figure mm-hmm. out what, what that company is worth, which is an, another one of these uh, satellite bus, man, satellite manufacturers, we can say. And, you know, they have a multi billion, uh, maybe like, two and a half billion dollar contract from a company called Ravana Networks that wants to build mm-hmm. a global constellation. As far as I can tell, Ravana Networks has not been funded for anything close to that full amount. I, I don't I don't have any specific knowledge, but I'm guessing we would have heard if, if they had raised the, a, a couple billion dollars. Um, and so like what do you do with that order? You know, how do you how do you underwrite that? Uh Terra World is a public company, so it's it's outside my realm. But yeah, that that makes it quite tricky. Um, one of the biggest learnings for me sitting in on meetings with space companies that are actually operating beyond just at the board level is I had, like many uh, other um, commenters on the space industry, we've talked a lot about how launch is overfunded. There's so many launch companies, don't invest in launch. And I, 
do mostly stand by that, but I did not appreciate just how much of a monopoly SpaceX is right now. SpaceX has just complete control. Like if, if you're trying to do a launch anytime in the next couple of years, um, you're probably going to get a no bid from other people. Um, you know, you'll, there, there's not that many people to go to. SpaceX is, is, is your only option and they, they are increasing their prices. They have, they have all of the leverage in the conversation. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I, yeah, and and I know you write a lot about launch. It, it, it it's I just did not have the appreciation for how uh, monopolized the market is right now. So th- it's 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 a great point, and 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 uh, certainly not a hot take, right? SpaceX is effectively <laughs> the monopoly right now. Yeah. Um. I, but 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 I'm curious. Like one of the things I struggle with, and I've written about this, um, as far as the launch market is concerned, in terms of, you know. If you actually look at history, right, historically, and you look yep. at um, companies that have had effective monopolies over key resources, over key technologies, and I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's exceptions, um, but I actually haven't found any significant ones where at some point the government didn't step in and do something and say, hey, you need to, you know, you need to break this apart, or you need to do this, or you need to do yep. that, or or some type of level of control or oversight that comes from the government that says, hey, you have too much control. Is that something that you, you know, you uh, see happening with SpaceX? Because now, you know, I'm hearing, I'm hearing, and this is complete, complete, like, I, I, I have to caveat, rumor is what I'll say, right? I've heard um, that SpaceX is thinking about other um, launch infrastructure in other countries, um, yep. where those, where that launch infrastructure is. And, and, you know, I've even heard a country where, you know, it made me kind of like, um, uh, sort of think, oh, well, if they're doing that, I, I can't imagine the U S government is going to be super thrilled about that. And, and, yeah. and I don't want to, I don't want to extend or expand any rumors yeah. that I've heard, but it is something interesting where I'm like, well, at some point there's going to be some, and, and actually I take a step back. There was a, I remember an interview with Elon probably a few years ago where I think they asked him like, it was like, hey, like when uh, when you guys finally do get to Mars, is that a U.S. like colony, a U.S. like yeah. la- landing, or is that a SpaceX landing? Yeah. And I think he said like it's a SpaceX landing. I think that yeah. rubs some people the wrong way. So, yeah. uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? I think the way I'm viewing dynamics right now is is very much through the lens of company's ability to raise capital to fund their businesses. So I think if the good times had kept on going, then, you know, these up and coming launch companies that are on the cusp, uh, you know, maybe Astro wouldn't have spec and they could have just stayed in the private markets and, um, you, know, you know, I think relativity is in the market. I'm not sure, but the, they, they'll raise the money they need and they'll get into market. But now, just there's just so little money in the system and we'll, we'll probably talk about this and so the odds of someone else making a you know heavy capacity rocket is probably pretty low for the next couple of years um with the exception of national kind of sovereign plays like you know germany there's you know isar isar is going to get funding because you know, ESA in Germany wants a domestic provider and India has its domestic. So there's like that domestic market, which I, I it took me a while to understand that, um, you know, yeah, c- countries will pay a massive premium to have their sovereign control over launch, which they just consider s- such an important uh, aspect. I, I mean, I, I, I get what you're saying about the government breaking monopolies. It doesn't feel like that's happening anytime soon. I mean, uh, SpaceX has its own reasons for wanting to split out Starlink, which, uh, you know, I think investors were have been kind of messaged that that's something that's going to happen and that's their path to liquidity. And so that's probably going to get spun out, but breaking up SpaceX's launch business, I, I've never, I haven't heard any, any mumblings about that. So I don't, can't imagine that happens in the next couple of years. Yeah. And then, and, and I certainly don't want to say that there have been any rumblings about that because I haven't yeah. heard any either, but it's more yeah. just like a dynamic where I like, they are they are truly 
truly, truly, truly like yeah. the most dominant player by a long shot. So it just yeah. kind of starts to beg the question. I mean, even, even, uh, even a few weeks ago, or maybe even a couple of weeks ago, news came out that, um, you know, the space force was changing their, you know, their procurement yeah. process to allow a third heavy launch provider. Right. So clearly, clearly it's on their mind. They want to diversify their, the, uh, the capabilities that they have access to, and they want to create more competition in any way possible. That's yeah. clearly a desire of the government, which lends itself to think that like, you know, if all of these other methods that don't work in 10 years, you know, is there, is there something that happens, right? Where the government says like, we cannot, yeah. we're so reliant on this company. We are so reliant on this company that it's becoming yeah. a real problem. In, you know, an in interesting part to that, there's, yeah, you know, government doesn't want to sole source. It, it wants to promote competition. The flip side to that, which is, you know, something I've seen play out is in some of these segments, there's not enough government money to go around to fund the companies to get to market. And if they, if they're too preoccupied with promoting competition there's a world where none of the companies succeed so there's just like everything has trade-offs it's it's right. no, like easy points here do, do you think that the government should expand um their sort of non-dilutive funding um pathways for space companies like if this is becoming it's um the one thing that is also starting to become clear and i've been i've been spending a little bit more time down in dc um is Space is definitely uh, a bipartisan, um, it, you know, it's, it's a focus. It's, you know, everyone cares about it, whether you're on the left or the right or whatever you may be. Um, it's, it's uh, especially because our adversaries as a country um, care about it significantly, yeah. are putting significant capital into it. Do you think that as a government uh, or the government is, and, and this is probably out of both of our wheelhouses, but let's, let's give it a shot and roll the dice and see if we can come up with anything insightful. Um, do you think the government should be, um, uh, doing more from a capital perspective in terms of programs, in terms of dollars. And we, I know we have, uh, there's a variety of different programs that companies can apply to today as a startup. Um, but to your point, it's not enough, right? And if the private capital markets yeah. are not there to help support these companies, a lot of these companies could go away, e even the ones that have reached some level of significant technical success. Yeah, I mean, if you're prioritizing for if you're the quote unquote government uh, or the national security apparatus optimizing for uh, national security and what's in the best interest of the country, then yeah, I got equivocally yes. For my experience with government contracts before entering kind of the CAM world, uh, which again, this is kind of like his secret sauce. So he's able to do things that I've not seen other startups really be able to do in terms of just just effectively bidding on these contracts is they're just so opaque like the odds of a former spacex engineer like figuring out how to properly execute a, a government capture you know contract it, it's it's just so difficult there's so much idiosyncrasies involved with it and so as a result like the most achievable pool of government capital i've seen is the stratfi program and, and there's been lots of aerospace companies that have gone to that. And that, and that itself is a pretty new development. Uh, I believe Will Roper, uh, the former assistant secretary of procurement, I think for the Air Force set it up. It was part of the Air Force Research Lab. And it is uh, it can be up to $60 million. And it's basically like a match. If you, you can raise $60 million in private, you get $60 million in public. That is like, that's achievable. Varda just got it. Boop Supersonic got it. A, a number of companies uh, are able to achieve that. That's a pretty meaningful amount of money. That money comes from my understanding the small business like administration funds. It, mm -hmm. It's like this tiny pool of capital. It's part of the only pool of capital that can be used without being budgeted ahead of time for R and D. I'm, I'm probably mumbling some of that up, but it's it's pretty it's, <clears throat> it's pretty sad that that's this like tiny. I think it's like two billion dollar year budget, which goes to fund Sibers. Uh, which is what Stratify is a part of, um, is so small. I <clears throat> I haven't seen uh, really like I haven't. I, I know a lot of people are talking about, it, which is great. I've, I haven't seen any new um, government 
vehicles that can do this, that can help expand the pool of capital. I would love to see that. What you're seeing is folks like Cam's companies that are just steeped in this, or you have Andro, which again is steeped in this. That's their, their, their they know that's their path. And so that they're deeply in, ingrained in that. But I still don't really see a path for a typical uh, startup to be able to reliably win or have, have a credible path to getting you know, a big, meaningful government eight, let alone nine figure contract. Yeah, no, I, 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 I actually, I do agree with that. I think, um, so I, I had a conversation, um, recently with a, uh, an individual who runs, uh, the aerospace and defense segment for a very large private equity firm. Um, one of the biggest in the world, in fact, and he, and he has been in the, um, industry for about 20, 25 years as an investor. Right. So clearly is, you know, but, but he's not funding seed stage bets on, you know, like, yeah. uh, um, on sort of what I call cutting edge space companies. Right. He's, he's focused on more sort of the bread and butter plays and yeah. how to attract value from more traditional methods of, of, of private equity investing. And, uh, I kind of asked him a very simple question, which was like, Hey, what do you think about the industry today? And what do you think about all the new startups and all the, all the, all the capital going into the new startups? Um, and he had one of the most, uh, I don't want to say negative, bearish takes that I had ever heard. He was like, I think most of these companies are going to go away. And I said, well, it's interesting. Why do you say that? He's like, well, um, it's going to be capital. Most of them are not going to be able to get to the dollars that they need. And it, it, yep. it's not a quite, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, um, you know, shot on the founders or the technologies that they're building or their ability to build those technologies. He says, but most of the companies don't have any real near term pathway to substantial revenue to support the business. So they're going to have to get continue to raise these big dollars. And I, I it's, it's, he's, he's, he was just like, it's going to be very, very hard. I, I, and he was like, yeah. think about it from the other perspective. Think about liquidity. He was like, how many of those today that are you know, space focused investors are building these, you know, um, franchises around space as a category investing, how many exits have they had within space, um, that have been successful exits, right? Take the SPACs out yep. of the equation. So, um, yep. you know, and, and I think these are all fair. I like, there's certainly counterpoints to all the things that he said, but I think it's an interesting way to think about it because, you know, um, th- this is a group that had, uh, the thought about doing a venture arm, to do this kind of stuff. And they actually had it for a little yeah. bit and they nixed it because they said it doesn't scale. We can't put in the dollars that we want into this industry right now. Anyway, so it's it just kind of an interesting take. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah. Yeah. I was just pulling up this um, spreadsheet. I think it's relevant here. This is growth stage space deals that were done in the past couple of years and, and kind of who led those deals. And let's see which, which of these groups is still actively in the market, uh, <laughs> Tiger Global, BlackRock, Fidelity, Co2, Bond, um, Valor, Newberger Berman, uh, we could keep going, CalPERS, uh, do SpaceX secondary. You know, the, there is not a big pool of space-focused capital. There is now on the early stage side, which is great, uh, seed, you know, you can, yeah, there, seed, seed, seed space capital is definitely, definitely available, but these growth stage rounds are so challenging right now. Uh, and it was always, it was always <laughs> challenging, but now the tourists have left, meaning kind of like speculative quote unquote retail investors that were, you know, kind of, uh, yellowing, um, during the bull run are gone. The crossover folks are gone. Um, and then the, yeah, big kind of growth equity uh, private market players are just so focused on protecting their existing portfolios that they're not deploying capital. So I think, unfortunately, there's a lot of good businesses that could they have crossed this kind of valley of death of, of raising the capital they needed, they would have built legitimately good cash flowing businesses that just aren't going to make it. There's just not enough money going around. So um, that is a tragic element of, of kind of the the moment that we're in. And so I don't know, the, the flip side is it's a survival of the fittest. So on, only the best are going to make it. Um, uh, but there, unfortunately, will be, a, yeah, I think, a culling. Yeah. And ultimately, like, it's going to be a good, it's a good, these types of 
um, you know, as much as it's uh, painful to watch kind of the founders and the teams and the companies go through um, these types of moments, ultimately, it's good for the industry, right? And it creates better and better companies and more resilient businesses over time. So um, yeah, there is a, there's certainly a silver lining. All right, so let's 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 be, let's let's get a little optimistic. <laughs> yeah. What what are are there any kind of tech uh, advancements in the industry um, that really excite you right now? That you're like, hey, there's I I, I see and 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 um, I see more and more and more folks working on this issue or problem, and yeah. you know I I think that a solution will be found at some point. Yeah, I think an area that I've just been steeped in uh, due to my close proximity to Axiom is um, micro microgravity applications, which um, yeah, uh, in space manufacturing, whether it's pharmaceutical development, material science, uh, fiber optic manufacturing. I mean, it is something I was familiar with. It was something I was pretty dismissive of because I just found it kind of impossible to tell what's going to be the right thing to build up there. Um, but now that I get to spend time with, you know, a lot of the uh, engineers and scientists that are working on these technologies, there's so much promise across so many different areas. I still don't know what the first killer application is going to be. And of course, you know, like Varda's, you know, making impressive progress on their, you know, very focused on, you know, uh, pharmaceutical development, protein crystallization, the, you know, advantage Axiom has, they will be the only ones that have manned manufacturing capacity. Everyone else is effectively trying to do, you know, like lights out manufacturing, fully automated. And so that kind of narrows your scope. Axiom, you know, bigger, more expensive infrastructure to put up, but uh, then you have the ability to actually, you know, service and, and have a human interact with these systems, which I think will be important. And we're kind of an agnostic platform. Um, and that there's, yeah, between bioprinting there, there's so many exciting uh segments that that i've gained a lot more conviction that like i don't know 10 years from now there some element of microgravity that will will be part of our our day-to-day -day life there's just there's so much momentum building there well, let's talk about the founder side for a second right so yeah. um you uh, you know you were an active investor for quite some time you were a founder yourself um and you're now working for a, a a fairly significant founder. So like, wh what is it that you look for? Um, and, and what are sort of the qualities that make for a, a successful founder in the industry? Yeah, I think there's like a bunch of things that, you know, always come up, whether it's, you know, greediness, it's going to be hard, you got to make sure you don't give up, you know, generally things that are more organically developed, you know, versus people sitting on a whiteboard coming up with an idea there. There's a bunch of uh, heuristics that uh, I do agree with. The biggest takeaway for me after having done it for many years and working with really incredible people like Cam and Greg Weiler and Jane Tabor at Space Perspective and many others is uh, uh, everyone has like a different word for this. For me, it's force of nature. Uh, uh, Paul Graham has an essay where he calls it like uh, you describe them as an animal. Um, and for me, that's the thing that delineates like great founders and like what I describe as like just the best in the world people is this force of nature quality that the way I've interpreted it is um, it's one, what they're working on is a compulsion. They like can't help themselves, you know, and especially like these serial entrepreneurs, it's not really like that rational to be doing what they're doing. Like, you know, they're not diversifying their investment portfolio by like investing a hundred million dollars into their next startup, their quality of life. You know, they could be sitting on a boat. They, they love the work, but like they really can't help themselves. They are just compulsively pursuing a future. And then you have this reality today that doesn't match that future. And they are just, breaking through that and just will not be stopped. And it's, uh, that to me has been like the most, and you can, you can just feel it. Like it, 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 it just as a result of interacting with enough founders, like you're like, okay, yeah, like you're, I mean, that's not to say that some of them won't, um, implode or do, you know, something it's not guaranteed success, but I think if that's what I would bet on. How about you? You're an active investor yourself. So, so I, I think that um, 
this is just fresh in my mind because I just recently rewatched Apollo 13. Um, and uh, there's a scene, if you if you remember, where um, uh, Gene Kranz, or, uh, played by Ed Harris, uh, he, he goes to the team um, at NASA and basically says, uh, at, at this point, you know, they got, they're trying to figure out a way to keep the astronauts alive. Um, and they say, hey, you know, or he says, hey, we, you know, in order to keep, you know, the astronauts alive, we need to make this kind of square cartridge compatible with a round one. And you can only use what's in this room right now because that's the only things yeah. that are available to them, right? And in effect, it's this like really interesting lesson on how necessity breeds in invention and innovation. Totally. And um, if you think about if you uh, if you also look, watch that scene, you'll see that you know they you know they place all this like you know random stuff on this table, and they say, okay, we got to figure this out, and you have like you know whatever an hour to do it. No one complains. You know, there was no, not a single complaint in that room, right? Everyone just it just dove right in. They're like, oh, shit, we got to figure this out. Um, and there's another, there's actually a really good quote. Um, in the movie. I don't know when it was, but it was like, I don't care what it was designed to do. I just want to, I just want to know what it can do. Right. So I, th- yeah. that's, I love that mentality. Um, I don't see that yeah. mentality enough, I think, in the industry. Um, because there's a yeah. lot of, uh, really awesome founders that are doing these really cool things, but you're just like, I get why that's cool, but do we need that? Right. Um, yeah. so to me, um, and, and I'm not saying this is a, 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 uh, sort of the, the only thing that you should be looking at as an investor, certainly not, but I do appreciate and, and, and like when a founder is focused on a problem that they have so much passion for, they feel like it's a necessity for, uh, for yeah. human so- society and civilization. And when you have founders that think like that to me, um, you know, they'll, they'll do whatever it takes to solve that problem. Right. Um, and it, and it sort of fits in line with some of the things you're saying, but I, to me that that's one of the things I look for, um, or I find most kind of exciting. So, uh, I, I do want to, um, let's, let's kind of uh, flip the card a little bit. Um, what are sort of common mistakes that you see founders making like early on where you're like, ah, oh, you know what? Like I've seen, I've seen folks do that a lot. D- don't do that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, a couple simple things. And it's one, I think I have a blog post if you look up like 32 questions you should ask a VC. Part of it is just like the understanding the mechanics of how a VC works, which I don't know when I was a founder, that would just make you much more effective at fundraising, uh, meaning uh, what is their process to invest? Who are the decision makers? Understanding that, you know, there's mid level people at funds, principals, associates who, We'll, we'll have conversations and they might want to do something and whether they want to do something and the partners will approve it may or may not be connected and depends on their ability to read the room and, 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 you know, be able to sell to that uh, partnership. But you have to know that you're dealing with an intermediary. You're not interacting directly with the decision maker. There's like, there's a lot of that, like inside baseball stuff. That's actually not, not that complicated, but um, is, is helpful to know. So it's, it's worth educating yourself on how VCs work and how they make decisions and how they invest. One like very basic thing, you as a deep tech CEO are going to have to raise a lot of money. And if it seems like you don't enjoy raising money, um, which uh, comes up all the time, just, you know, I'll, like I'll, I'll call it out just like, you, you know, it, it really looks like you're not enjoying this process. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, you either need to find someone that does, or you need to convince yourself uh, to love the process or at least put on a good face because that that's just like an obvious red flag because um, it's just going to be a key part of survival. I think uh, the other thing that brings to mind just in the current environment, there is companies that there, because how, because of how easy it was to raise money, there wasn't a lot as much discipline on thinking through milestones related to unlocking the next rounds, the next round of capital, meaning, uh, so I'm going to raise this $4 million seed round, and that's going to get me to CDR on my Pathfinder. Um, and then I'm going to go out and raise money. Well, will you be able to raise $25 million without having something in space and without certain amount of uh, customer contracts probably not or whatever you know yeah. th- that that perspective i think um that discipline maybe has been missing and i have been seeing i feel like companies where i just don't think 
either they're going to have to change their plans or they need to raise a lot more money, but they're going to get stuck in a dead end. And it's it's still actually not uh, super difficult to raise a seed round. There, there's enough money there and liquidity there. So you can raise a couple million dollars, but those companies run a huge risk of getting stuck, uh, being unfundable like two years from now. Yeah, I couldn't. I actually couldn't agree with that more. And I think um, actually one of the things that I've I see within sort of the, the deep tech universe in general, you're dealing with highly technical, highly complex problems, which require highly, you know, technical, highly complex f- folks, right? And 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 yep. typically, what uh, uh, the, the common sort of missing trait I've seen in founders is the lack of ability to um, tell their story in a cohesive way mm-hmm. that makes sense to investors, right? Because you might yep. have a really cool product problem if you can't get that vision statement out on what you're building and why you're building it and why it's important and why yeah. it's a big market. Um, I, I've seen that. Uh, I, I guess what I'll say is um, I, I don't think people spend nearly as much time crafting and perfecting that yeah. um, as much as they should. And it usually comes out later in sort of the life cycle. And I, and I, and I also agree with the fact that um, most people can uh, underestimate the level of skill needed sometimes to raise money. And it's not an area where um, sometimes they invest in themselves to be able to get to that point or invest in others, meaning like bring in someone to actually actually do that. And that role and that skill set right now, right, amongst uh, it's probably, in, in my opinion, and I don't know, I'm talking to you disagree, like it's probably the most sought after role right now across the uh, across um, investors themselves, like GPs who are raising capital. Um, and also yep. companies who are raising capital, bringing someone on board that knows how to raise capital, right? So it's interesting, like, um, it's probably like one of the most, <laughs> so any, anyone yeah. listening out there that's looking it's, for it's, something new to do. <laughs> yeah, that, and that's an op- open, I mean, there's there's always lots of different ways to win, but I'm still thinking through if, if the CEO can really delegate fundraising to someone else. I think it, it, it and I couldn't agree more with the storytelling. Like if there's any skill a CEO should learn, it's, it's it's storytelling. I don't think it's it's restricted to fundraising. I think the CEO is the conveyor of the vision of you know the future that they're trying to build, and your ability to attract employees, customers, partners, and investors is based on your ability to credibly tell that story. Mm-hmm. Another thing you see when you work with lots of different founders is the more the better the storyteller the further out in the future they can present their vision. So if you're, it's your first time around and you're a little meek, you'll probably talk about what you want to accomplish a year from now. If, uh, not to Brown knows my boss, but if you talk to Cam, like he'll probably tell you about <laughs> uh, like our trip to Alpha Centauri in 2040. And at, when you're done talking to him, you'll be like, yeah, it's not like he will convey that certainty of that vision. Right. And that is what gives you the ability to, convince people to join the team and, and partner with you and NASA to you know work with you. Um, so and, and uh, there's a really great TED talk. I also wrote a blog post about this by this woman, Nancy Duarte. I think I'm pronouncing her name right. She was uh, the coach or consultant to Steve Jobs for all of his keynote presentations. And she talks a lot about how to uh, uh, craft a good story for presentations and strongly recommend that. Uh, Anton, I know we're running out of time here. How can people find your blog? We've been referencing it so often today. <laughs> where, where, how, how do people yeah. read, read all the things you're writing? Yeah, if, if you look up uh, Anton Brevdy Medium or Anton Brevdy Space, I'm sure it'll pop, pop up. I've taken a, a, a bit of a hiatus as I've uh, been onboarding at IBX, but I'll be, I'll be writing some more blog posting again. Um, and uh, my email is anton at ibx llc.com. Uh, everyone's welcome to reach out. Is there anything that's on your mind right now that you're like, I can't wait to write about this? Um, I don't know. Giving my my three year old a hug after this is done is, is kind of what's on my mind. All right, well, let's leave you in suspense. <laughs> let's let's uh, let's get you to that. I really I really appreciate you being on the show uh, today. This is great, super fun, uh, super interesting conversation. So uh, can't wait to have you back. Thank you, Mel.